No, actually, none whatsoever. And I mean, I, I, I love sports. I, I watch sports. But I even to this day, I couldn't name you one top water skier. I simply was was not uh, interested in that part of the, of the sport. And uh, I just uh, did it out of pure enjoyment of, uh, of getting to see new places and uh, do, do a few turns. So if it was 80s or 90s or 2000s, if it was popular in the, in the US or around the world, I... I'm the wrong guy to ask. I simply didn't didn't pay any attention. All right, everyone, welcome back or welcome to the Water Ski Podcast. The podcast for water skiers, the podcast for those who are interested in water skiing, the podcast who uh, ambitiously tries to promote the sport of water skiing. So welcome back after a little week off. I've been in Denmark coaching and then right back from the airport to Italy, straight to Jolly to do some more coaching. So yeah, I've been in the boat a lot, which has been good fun. So this episode of the podcast is with Daniel Zimmerman. Now, if you are a competitive water skier, you most definitely have never heard of this name. This is a water skier who I met about a month and a half ago, um, who basically has been skiing for, for ages, but just recently decided to take a shot at the slalom course. And this is someone who has skied in some of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. Uh, Jamaica, Guatemala, Greece, Croatia, Ireland. Like great bodies of water where he just strapped his ski on and did some turns behind a boat. And only recently has gotten curious about what we should call, I guess, what we can call competitive water skiing, like a slalom course, ramps, tricks. Um, And it was a very enlightening encounter. Um, So here's someone who is just in as much of a water skier as I am. He's been doing the sport for as many years as I have, yet we just have been looking at the sport from completely different angles, Um, just, I guess, due to life, life, discovering it sooner or later at a vacation club rather than a competitive ski club, in my case. Um, so I decided to have him sit down in front of microphones and just chat about him and how he got into the sport and what his impression of competitive water skiing is. Because he got to experience a fair bit uh, just being around jolly skiers, young and old, that are training and in preparation for competition, say. Um, so I, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. The episode is brought to you by the Flowpoint Method. By now you should know the Flowpoint Method is an online water ski training program developed by Jenny Labaw and Marcus Brown, one of the guests of this show, who, fair warning, both of them will be, well, I guess Marcus will be coming back on the podcast and also Jenny will join him and we'll get a chance to talk and ask ask more in-depth question to them about the method. But they cover technique, fitness, nutrition, mindset. This is a truly holistic approach uh, to water skiing and is really recommended, in my opinion, to those who take their water skiing seriously, no matter what level you're at. Um, I love it. I believe they have the right approach, and I'm collaborating with them on the mindset section of the Flowpoint Method daily, weekly updates, and an extremely extensive library of videos, instructions, and writings. With the Flowpoint method, you can finally remove all the guesswork and get the most of your time on the water. You can become a member of the Flowpoint method by going to thewaterskipodcast.com slash method or click on the link in the show notes. They have a three days uh, free trial, and now they've just added a new month-by-month su- subscription which gives you a chance to sort of ease in into the program and see if it is for you. I honestly believe that if you are anyhow serious about your skiing, again, no matter what level you're at, 
um, approaching the course to trying to run 41 off, I think this is something you really ought to consider. So again, you can go on the waterskipodcast.com slash method one word. Enough with the intro. Enjoy this episode with Daniel. Should we start? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Daniel, welcome to the Waterski Podcast. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you for having me. So why don't we t- you tell the audience, like we're here in San Gervasio in the famous Judges Tower. Uh, you've been skiing with us for what, about three weeks now? Not even. I think 18 days. Uh, didn't even know about this place uh, till three weeks ago. So here I am. Uh, b- by the way, I didn't even ask you, how did you find out about us? Well, I've skied some uh, on the lakes around in Iseo and uh, Lago di Garda and uh, going quite frequently between Slovenia, Switzerland, the United States. And uh, after this uh, COVID crisis, I uh, just wanted to get out and uh, get some skiing in and uh, plan to go to Iseo or Garda again. And uh, and I think uh, a German guy in Garda told me about this uh, professional school and uh, lake uh, near Brescia and... Uh, Thought well, go check it out. That's <laughs> how I came here. Uh, yeah, just a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, which uh, you know, like I think this is going to be one of the things we'll be talking about in this episode. Like you mentioned, Lake Iseo, Lake Garda. Which, if you have ever been to Italy or you know anything about Italian geography, these are famous places. But for water skiers, or at least, sorry, for skiers who compete and do tournaments and all of that, these are unknown places. They know San Gervasio or other ski sites, right? But that's now not how you got into skiing. And so the question comes, which I asked to all my guests, how did you get into water skiing? Well, I never really thought about water skiing as a, as a competitive sport, more as of a you know, recreational thing, a sightseeing thing to do, not to get bored while you're in beautiful places around the world on oceans or rivers or lakes and... Uh, uh, I'm coming from a you know, competitive sport background in athletics and uh, always try to uh, find new ways to, to move. So I think it was about just a little less than 30 years ago, I was in the Caribbean in a beautiful resort and uh, they had a boat and they had a ski and I said, well, might as well just try it out. As you can imagine, uh, in the Caribbean Ocean, uh, it's a little bit wavy. It's uh, Nobody talks about slaloming and... Uh, I just tried it, and uh, you know, I'm looking back. I think it was more like a rodeo than water skiing. <laughs> I felt like uh, you know John Wayne on a horse, uh, going up and down through the through the big waves. But it was a nice way to see the world from a different angle than uh, the shore. So I think that's uh, how my curiosity started. And uh, you know, after that, I just uh, tried to find a boat and some skis uh, wherever I, my travels uh, were taking me. So. And that's key, right? So it, it was something to do at a beautiful place, but that must have left a mark because for you to then go out and, and seek it, like how was that first set? I mean, you said it was probably a, a John Wayne rodeo, but like, what do you remember? Well, I remember the water was really salty and I think I <laughs> swallowed a lot of it because <laughs> the boat was not very powerful and, uh, you know, you had to get out, uh, you know, you got out, then you just tried to stay up. I it was, you know, quite, uh, as growing up in Switzerland, I was a good downhill skier, alpine skier, so I knew what it felt like to have uh, two skis under your feet, but uh, obviously underwater, it's, it's, it's a little bit different, but I, I enjoyed it, I liked it, it was, you know, it was a challenge, uh, I could feel the muscles get a little bit sore, and I thought, well, this is something nice to do when you're near the water, I, you know, I grew up as a kid near Lake Zurich, and always had water around me, but until... Uh, I was really well into uh, my late 20s. I never tried it, but uh, I'm really glad I did, and it just went went from there. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, Switzerland, downhill skier. You also told me that you competed track at the collegiate level. So you, you have a background as an athlete. Yeah, I was uh, competing in, uh, in high jump uh, in, in my junior years and uh, was able to get a scholarship to go uh, uh, to the U.S. and competed uh, collegiately for, for UCLA in uh, 86, 87. And actually, uh, the team won uh, two collegiate national championships those years. Uh, 
I had tremendous uh, teammates. I was one of the lower tier athletes there, but I had top level athletes that became uh, Olympic champions, uh, world record holders, uh, you know, training there every day. And it was uh, a great experience. And uh, still some of them are my, my good friends uh, 30 years later. Nice. letting the boat go for a second Oops. all right good yeah okay so clearly you were involved in sports, and this is just something that I'm keen on right now. Maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, high jump, snow skiing, very technical sports, right? Yeah, certainly, the, you know, I think there's, there's technical aspects to, to, to any sport. And I think, uh, you know, ultimately, it's, uh, any athletic movement requires uh, some skill, some precision. And, uh, of course, some sports uh, are more similar to each other than others. But I think uh, the, the basic uh, uh, fundamentals are almost identical in all sports. Yeah. So, like, uh, appropriate movements... Yeah, I think of core strength, uh, balance, uh, you know, having a feeling w what your body does and under which stress situations. And I think that, you know, that certainly, you know, helps you to, to pick up uh, different kinds of sports, different kinds of movements. And uh, I learned to, uh, to ski or do athletics at a very young age. But uh, athletics, they say, is the mother of all sports or maybe the purest form of sports, uh, you know, running as fast as you can, jumping as high as you can. So I think it teaches you the, uh, the the basics that uh, you can benefit from in in any sport you do and actually i take it a step further in anything you do in life oh wow wow well probably some of that bleeding into your skiing because you know or at least in terms of like passion because i mean you told me you never received any coaching before Right? You just no, the first skiing? coaching I received here, whatever, two and a half weeks ago when, <laughs> when Matea got in the boat with me and <laughs> told me what to do. So it was, it was a great new experience and I, I enjoyed it because uh, it reminded me of uh, when I was doing competitive sports in a completely different uh, uh, sport. But uh, it's the same. It's, it's, it's teaching, it's passion, it's you have to have mentors or somebody that uh, gives you the, uh, the desire and the passion to, to improve. And I think anybody at any age, anywhere can improve uh, something if they set their mind to it. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And what's that? Because, but then again, like you said, you, you had that first set and then basically for years, like a lot of years, anywhere you found water, you would ski. So probably it wasn't really improvement that drove you to ski all this time, was it? No, I think it was the, the, the pure joy of, of uh, being on the water and having to work a little bit uh, physically, uh, you know, accelerate, uh, you know, on the, on the outside of the, of the boat, uh, seeing uh, beautiful sights, uh, sunsets, sunrises, uh, and uh, just being uh, at peace with, uh, with what nature has to offer. And yeah, there is a motorboat in front of you that makes some noise. Some people don't like that or some people think it's not uh, uh, environmentally conscious. But, uh, you know, I didn't mind that. I just uh, looked at the, the beauty of it and I, I just enjoyed uh, being out on the, on the water. It gives you something to do besides just uh, sitting in the sun or uh, going on a walk. Yeah. So... Obviously, that first time you tried with two skis, when did you switch to one ski? Like, how did that come about? I think that was, I was in the Bahamas at a, at a Club Med, and uh, they also had water skiing there as part of the whole package. So it didn't really uh, matter how many times you had to try. But uh, I remember trying to get out with, with one ski, and it was, it was challenging. I think it took me, took me a couple of days to... Uh, to, to really get out and feel comfortable. But then I think it's just another, another step to enjoy more, to have more fun, because obviously it's easier to maneuver. It's easier to, to catch speed. Uh, it's, uh, I think, easier to uh, turn sharp left, right. And so 
it was just a, a progression. I'm, I'm glad uh, I tried with one, and uh, you know, then it went from there. And I, I wanted to just wherever uh, I can to, to try to get on a ski without even thinking of a course. I didn't even uh, understand the concept of uh, a course and slalom on the water. I didn't watch watch videos. I didn't really didn't really care. I just enjoyed doing it uh, when I found the time and the place to do it. So let me ask you this because you kind of live across Europe and the US. Um, what, so let's say mid 80s up to early 90s, were you primarily in the US or Europe? Well, I was, I was uh, in the 80s. I, I went to college in the US, so I was five years in, in, in the US. Then I got a, a serious job uh, in, in 89 uh, in Switzerland working for a sports marketing agency and uh, stayed in Switzerland for. Uh, uh, pretty much five, five, six years, uh, and then uh, after that, uh, I moved uh, permanently back to the U.S. in uh, in 2000, and uh, still kept my ties to Switzerland. My my family lives in Switzerland, uh, and I, I have my business mainly out of Switzerland. So it gave me the chance to uh, to travel a lot. I enjoy travel. I travel a lot uh, when I was. Uh, really young uh, and uh, you know got the taste of of, of the world and uh, you know kept uh, kept going uh, as as much as I could and tried to find uh, also exotic places with water where where I could possibly ski. Yeah, the reason why I was asking you that is that that for a lot of people those years are considered the the glory days of water skiing and by that I mean ESPN showing tournaments, you know, like we had a pro tour with, you know, let's call it legitimate cash prices. Obviously, you can't compare it to the tennis and golfs and, and, and even snow skiing. It's not comparable. But that's that was when competitive water skiing was, at least in the U.S., on TV. Like people were aware of who Bob Lapointe was, like, you know, any map, all these big names. So I was curious to see if you... If you had at least as a, as a viewer, as a consumer, if you had that experience, no, actually none whatsoever. And I mean, I I, I love sports. I I watch sports, but I even to this day I couldn't name you one top water skier. I simply was was not uh, interested in that part of the of the sport, and uh, I just uh, did it out of pure enjoyment of uh, of getting to see new places and uh, do do a few turns. So. If it was 80s or 90s or 2000s, if it was popular in the in the US or around the world, I I'm the wrong guy to ask. I simply didn't didn't pay any attention. So. <laughs> no, but that's awesome. <laughs> that's and honestly, that's why I'm interviewing you because to me that's that's so cool. You know, like you know how many snow skiers are out there that wouldn't be able to name one single big time snow skier, but that means that the sport is healthy, in my opinion. Like there's a lot of people that do the sport just to do it. And growing up as a competitive water skier, always being told the sport is small, the sport is small, not a lot of people do it. And so to me, the only the pyramid is very skewed, right? It's only those who do the sport, right? Whereas like skiers like you, who I have, are completely oblivious to professional water skiing or, or competitive water skiing, but are skiing, you told me you skied in Guatemala, in Costa Rica, in Jamaica, I mean... I never even been to these places. Yeah, I, I, I think it, you know, it shows that uh, maybe water skiing has some catching up to do in terms of uh, uh, giving a chance to people to enjoy it. And uh, you know, I well maybe was lucky to to stay away from the the competitive side. I don't mean that in, in disrespectfully at all. Actually, I'm I'm enjoying very much those two weeks I've been here now at, at San Gervasio, enjoying uh, uh, people skiing at a, at a at a very very high level. But uh, I think a sport like water skiing can be for anybody, and uh, it doesn't uh, doesn't need to be competitive. Doesn't need to be slalom or trick skiing, or I guess they're jumping as well. I didn't even know they were jumping until I came here and saw some ramps, and it looked like they were jumping. And yeah, they were definitely jumping. I've seen ski jumpers going. 200 some meters in the winter but uh, it's just as impressive to see somebody going 40 50 60 meters uh, on the water and uh, when when they hit it's uh, it's an impressive sound and i'm glad uh, i i got to see that but i think uh, you know any lake any water any ocean uh, 
uh, anybody that uh, wants to try it somehow should be able to get exposure to it. And unfortunately, I found myself, it's, it's not easy to, to, you know, to get a boat, to find a rope, to find a ski. You know, I think most people find it an inconvenience to travel with a, with a ski bag and their own rope and, uh, you know, send uh, a, a nice boat along the way. It's just not going to happen. So. Right, right. <laughs> Why don't we touch a little bit on some of the, the places, like just before we started recording, you showed me some like impressive pictures. So, tell me some of the places where you skied over the years. Well, as I said, it, it started out in, in, in the Caribbean because I was living and, and going to, to grad school on the East Coast of the U.S. So I spent, uh, you know, a couple, you know, once or twice a year down in the Caribbean and uh, uh, obviously, it's not uh, the, the water skiing mecca of the world, but uh, you could find boats or you could find somebody that, that had a ski, took you out. And, uh, uh, you know, that way, you know, gave me something to do in, in beautiful locations. I mean, those are places that people go go on holidays. And I'm, I mean, I'm too active just to go on holidays and lay on a beach somewhere. So uh, I, I try to, you know, seek out uh, the opportunities uh, on the water and then... Uh, uh, a little bit later on, uh, also had two kids that uh, like the water, that enjoy sports. And so uh, I got my boat license in, in Croatia, actually. So in, in Croatia, I can rent a boat and I can go wherever I want. I can pull whoever I want. And uh, uh, so it, it uh, you know, I explored it a little bit to make it a little bit easier and uh, uh, found, you know, beautiful places to ski on the Dalmatian coast, uh, uh, they have a national park there called Kornati National Park, which uh, has, I mean, perfect conditions for skiing. It can be totally flat when the wind comes from the south. It's uh, still, you don't see a single wave. Uh, there's no boat wakes around because it's, it's a national park. And you can really enjoy in, in beautiful nature, uh, see sunrises, sunset, and it's uh, very, very peaceful. Obviously... Again, it's, uh, it takes a little bit of extra effort. You need your own boat. You need your own equipment because there's no, there's no <laughs> rental location out in the, in the middle of the Mediterranean. And uh, it always gave me an additional uh, challenge uh, when you try to find a vacation spot or a, pl a place you like to visit. Well, do they have water skiing? They, there's a lake. There must be a, ch a way to, uh, to go skiing. So... Uh, Went to uh, Central America a few times, uh, uh, backpacking in the in the 80s without any money, obviously without ski or even trying to ski because I didn't know about it at that time. And then went back to, to Guatemala to Lake Atitlan, which is a volcanic lake in a very historic uh, setting and uh, actually found a French guy that had a boat and had a ski and uh, uh, was, I guess, skiing in France as a competitive skier when he was young before he moved to Guatemala and so I had a fantastic week uh, there you know, skiing on the lake whenever I wanted and uh, he was driving the boat and he was very happy to have another guy there that drives the boat so he can ski and <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> so it works uh, it works out uh, I think three four years ago I uh, uh, went to uh, Ireland uh, for skiing this was also very adventurous because uh, it's Atlantic Ocean. It gets very cold and uh, very breezy. It was, uh, I think, end of June or early July, and uh, water 12, 13 degrees Celsius. You need a you know, thick wetsuit and gloves and a hat and uh, behind a little boat. But uh, again, great experience and uh, beautiful scenery to see. Yeah, so <laughs> you said it was in Guatemala that you found that uh, French skier that had a boat. But how do you... How did you go about it? Like, you, you were at a hotel and you asked someone, hey, do you know someone that water skis? Like, was it internet? Like, No, actually, that guy I think I found on, on, uh, on Airbnb and uh, uh, started to converse with him because I was just looking for a house on the lake. And then uh, and I was asking him, uh, are there any boats that uh, can do water skiing and uh, he says yeah i have a boat i have a water ski and i said well that's just fantastic i will just rent your house and your boat <laughs> 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 and so uh, that was you know a little bit lucky but i think uh, you know it shows when when you ask uh, things uh, you can get results if you don't ask or go out of your way you will you will never find out what uh, what is possible yeah i think in general terms that's certainly true to me more specifically it tells me that if you're passionate about water skiing, you're going to find a way to ski. 
for sure i think for for, for any passion if you if you're passionate about something you'll find a way to satisfy that passion or that desire and i think uh, you know water skiing did did that to me at a at a very relaxing uh, uh, steady uh, i think very balanced uh, way where i enjoy it and i never felt any any pressure never any stress it was just simply uh, pure relaxation to having the the opportunities and the, the chance to to do it in various locations yeah and then you told me you taught your your son and your daughter how to ski as well. Well, I don't know if I if if I taught them much. I mean, we just this kind of trial and error. You know, you, we we uh, we had a boat and we had a rope and uh, got them to bought two used skis on Craigslist where they just uh, slip in. And uh, obviously, it's much better to to learn something when you're six, seven, eight years old than when you're in your twenties or thirties. So I think it came pretty easy to them and uh, they uh, they liked it they also liked uh, the water and so uh, it was it was a good match yeah no that's that's unbelievable and to me i know that this shouldn't be a surprising story but again it's it's back to what we were saying before like we we are unfortunately as competitive water skier skiers a little bit enclosed in our own bubble and this is how the sport should be, in my opinion, you know. Then, of course, there's the competitive side and there's the, you know. But water skiing is something that you can do wherever there's a body of water and a rope and, and a boat that can pull you. That's, to me, that's the gist of it, you know. Um, tell me, because you've been here for, for a few days. You, I think when you showed up, you said you, you wanted to see the course. Uh, but you did say that you saw the course before, Right. Well, yeah, I saw I saw buoys uh, before in, in in a lagoon in, uh, in in California near San Diego. Didn't really know what uh, what they meant. Uh, actually, they they just looked like a, a little maze of, uh, of of three different colors, if I remember right. And uh, I had no clue what you actually do with them. And uh, I was on on the on that lagoon once uh, skiing, and the driver asked me if I want to go through the course, and I said, "Sure, go through the course." <laughs> But I didn't really know what the course was, so <laughs> I, I tried to ski uh, around the little yellow buoys left, right. The guy started to laugh, and I realized that this is not how you do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, that was the, the one and only time I, I, I tried it, and until I came here, and, uh, and Matteo explained to me how, how this is set up, and this is standard around the world, the same thing with the, uh, you know, with the buoys a certain distance from the, the pylon, the, the yellow ones are where the boat goes through, and so when I looked at it uh, here the last few weeks, it started to make sense, and I think now I can understand at least what the, what the aim is and uh, where the competitive skiers uh, are uh, going towards. Yeah, yeah. Now, We've been working on it, right? Like we've been working in the last two and a half weeks. Compared to, I guess, the skiing you were doing up until three weeks ago, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't keep doing it, but let, let's say how you were on the ski, how you would ski behind the boat or on the side of the boat. Um, what are some of the challenges you're finding now as, you, as we're trying to get you to run the course? Well, I think it's like learning... An, uh a new sport for me because I never had instructions. I never really thought about uh, what to do or not to do. I just uh, uh, was happy to be behind the boat and making some turns, uh, mostly outside of the wake on one side of the boat where, you know, where it's easy, where you can pull out and uh, not much can happen. And uh, most boats uh, I was behind uh, created uh, really huge wakes. So you didn't really go over the wake uh, the way you, you do when uh, when you compete in, in slalom or try to, to ski the course. So this was something completely new and uh, I, I, I like it. I appreciate uh, uh, you know, the professional input and patience uh, that I get here from Matteo and uh, his staff. And I felt a little improvement uh, Every day, and uh, I think now, in theory, I know what's uh, what's important uh, to be able to get into a course and eventually, com you know, com complete the course. Uh, but it's it's no pressure for me. I've you know I've, I think I will do it eventually, and uh, I'm sure it will be a great feeling to do it. But uh, I think most important, uh, all the the lessons help me to step better on the ski, to feel better on the ski, to be better balanced better, which uh, will help me 
to do the skiing that I've been doing, which for sure I will continue to do. Whenever there's water and there's boats, I will try to try to ski, and I think uh, it will become much easier and even more fun. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a lot of like repositioning on the ski, like tr- starting to feel acceleration. Obviously, here you have a boat where you can cross the wakes. So there's also that hump a little bit to, to pass over and trying to maintain that position as you go through the wakes. So there are some technical side to the sport that probably need, need to happen before you can turn buoys, which uh, I think some people sometimes don't really understand, right? Like you have to get in a certain position before you're able to, to progress. Um, yeah, so we started with the mini course, right? The first, probably the, even the first day you came here, we did the mini course. Yeah, the first day we did, and I think uh, uh, you know, second morning uh, I was I was able to uh, to run half of it, and I think the the, the third time uh, the, the whole mini course. So you know, it's nice to have little little goals like in any sport. I think uh, that's important. I think for any project in any job, it's important to have uh, have goals that you can uh, reach that they are realistic but ambitious, and uh, you know, certainly that that helps to. To be around uh, professional skiers, to be around uh, young skiers that are top level, to to see them grow up, to see them work and see them improve uh, little things uh, every day. And uh, certainly everything you know, takes time. Also, you, you cannot go high jump if you cannot uh, run straight or jump straight you know you have to uh, do the basic work and uh, obviously for for me having skied let's say in the wrong way for for 20 plus years uh, without uh, having the solid uh, technical base uh, this is an adjustment and uh, uh, i embrace it i like it it's uh, uh, maybe similar to when carving skis came in Alpine and anybody that uh, uh, was skiing before on the you know, 205 uh, meter skis uh, tried to switch to the new technique. It was like learning a new sport. That was in 89, 99 uh, when that revolution happened in Alpine skiing. And uh, I look at it a little bit similar here for for uh, my water skiing. I, I did it a certain way and now I have to learn another way to be able to uh, get into the course and uh, you know do what most people consider serious water skiing yeah yeah which again i, I don't know that a, a serious has a lot of connotations right like <laughs> i think one of the things that that is clear to me is that it's just water skiing you know it is water skiing like whether you're in croatia in the midst of two beautiful rocks on a, on a sunrise or you're here trying to run the course at very short rope lengths, it's water skiing regardless, right? Um, I want to I wanna maybe talk about two stories, like going back to the fact that, you know, this sport is very accessible in terms of, like, age, and, you know, like, you can, you can basically start it at any moment in your life. Um, we had, this, just this week, we had two pretty cool experiences. The first one is Tanya. And maybe you can say a few words about her. Well, I, I, I think like, uh, you know, most sports nowadays, uh, equipment uh, improved uh, tremendously. There's a lot of technology that goes into all the sports uh, uh, that uh, have uh, bigger participation rates. You know, it's the same in cycling. It's in tennis. I mean, if I compare a tennis racket from you know, 1980 with, uh, with you know John McEnroe or Bjorn Borg playing with wood or boron graphite, and now you look at the rackets that uh, they're using. It's uh, uh, a, a huge step forward. I think similar in in water skiing. I think anybody, pretty much at any age now, can pick up the sport and have a, a great experience. I've seen here in those uh, two weeks, uh, you know, people that never been on the water, they get up and they ski. Uh, people that tried a few times uh, with some uh, uh, new equipment, uh, like a hoverboard from HO, which is uh, which is a great, I think, compromise for somebody that wants easy free skiing but still uh, have the slalom experience. And uh, you know, people can do it. Uh, I think at any age, uh, anywhere, if they have good instructions, if they have an open mind, and. Uh, just do as uh, Matteo said. Do water skiing because it's really it's it's a simple sport. This means you have skis and you go on the water, and uh, anything else uh, comes afterwards. But uh, I think it's important for the sport to grow, to get uh, 
people on the water and have uh, have them try it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean the the cool thing, like I was referring to a skier that came here on Tuesday, uh, fifty years old, fifty one, uh, never skied before. And we got her on the overcraft and basically got to ski 25K, so super safe, um, and got to do turns left and right and pulled. And, you know, someone with uh, a background in gymnastics and, you know, like, like back in the day, and she was able to ski and enjoy the water. And now she skied four times and, and started to do turns. Like the equipment is important in this sport and it can certainly accelerate um, not only the, the progression, but especially the enjoyment. I mean, let's face it. You said it yourself. When you were in that um, in the club in the Bahamas, it took you, what, two days to learn how to start the... Yeah, at least. And a lot of swallowing water. Salt water is worse than fresh water. <laughs> a lot goes through your nose and comes out wherever it comes out. You know, it's not... It's not... It's not... Uh, it's not uh, too much fun, but on the other side, uh, you know, any sport uh, to to do it uh, at a little bit better level, it uh, requires some persistence and sacrifice. And I think it's, you know, water skiing is is nicely in the middle. It's not too difficult. It's not uh, too easy. You have to work for it, but uh, anybody can do it. And for me. Uh, and I, um, every time I, I see it, I'm, uh, I have to take a pause and really be impressed is that there's a, a kid, I don't know how old he is, maybe 17, 18 years old. He's blind and uh, yeah, he skis on the course. And uh, I think it, uh, it's a humbling experience to, to see somebody like that, uh, uh, despite uh, the, the handicap, not seeing going behind a boat, going, you know, 40, whatever K an hour, making turns on the whistle and really enjoying it. So I think uh, uh, that can be an, an example for anybody, that the water skiing is, uh, is for anybody at any age, uh, anywhere in the world. If they want to try it, they should go and, uh, and find a place where they can do it. Yeah, and I think that message can be stressed enough because I think that, at least in my experience here at Ski School, a lot of people show up, they see the boat, they might see others doing certain things, you know, like even just coming out of the water and skiing and going, wow, like this is too intimidating, right? Like this is, I would never be able to do that. But as, as we just said, like from any corner of the world, from any condition, you can come and, and enjoy time on the water. And it goes without saying that first experience, right? That's why it's so critical. Like you get out and you're sliding on water. Like we're not supposed to do that. Like we're, <laughs> we're not built <laughs> to do that, right? But then you experience it and you go, okay, I want more. And then the person stays in the sport and keeps enjoying it. And I think it's the, it's the access to it that's that's so important. And I think every... You know, obviously there's, uh, like in every sport, there's governing bodies, there's federations, and uh, I think they have to do a, a better job to open the eyes to people that this is something that uh, anybody can enjoy. It's something families can enjoy. Uh, I mean, when I, when I came here the first time uh, two and a half weeks ago, there was a, a Russian family living in Switzerland here, you know, a guy with his wife and... Uh, two kids and they are all having a blast and they, they are getting more serious and they're enjoying it. And uh, I think not only is it, uh, is it something you can do with your kids when they're small, you can do it uh, when uh, you might be grandpa or even older and uh, ski with your kids and their kids. And I saw, you know, a lot of uh, older people in, the, in their sixties doing great turns, having a, a lot of fun and in, enjoying it. And it's, uh, to me, also, alpine skiing is like that. It's something you can do together with uh, with multiple generations and your family for, for a long, long time. And uh, it's uh, the nice part about it. See, that's funny how, despite you said you you were never, like, into that sort of, like, competitive side of skiing, you understand competitive sports. So your point about federations and, and doing a better job at promoting the sport so applies to water skiing they like you wouldn't believe you wouldn't believe like if you go back in the in the archives of the water ski podcast you'll find hours and hours of conversations regarding you know 
institutions and, and stuff like that. But, um, but I think it also comes down to, you know, initiatives like the one I'm doing with the podcast or even just word of mouth. Like there's a great um, uh, initiative in the U.S. which is called Pass the Handle. Happens once a year, and all you do is basically encourage, <clears throat> excuse me, encourage people that ski to teach someone how to ski. You know, it's simple as that. You know, word of mouth, uh, like really having that sort of like passion to also want to spread the word. You know, which I think water skiing is cool enough to wanting to do that. Yeah, I think it's it's very important to to do that, and also the, you know the mindset of of people that. Uh, have boats or have water skiing schools needs to be to bring as many young people or people of any age for that matter uh, to the sport and uh, i think that's the that's the challenge because it's fairly expensive to have the operations to have the boats that run well that are you know high performing but uh, i think everybody should take a step back and and think of you know what if i don't teach anybody what if uh, there's no uh, new kids or new people coming to the sport eventually the sport will not uh, be looking too great and nope. i think many i mean many sports and uh, you know i follow sports uh, intensely also professionally for many 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 years and uh, a lot of uh, federations have this problem skiing has this problem that they lost a lot of uh, people to uh, to other sports or simply to to doing nothing and uh, there's initiatives uh, in place that work you know you mentioned past the handle in water skiing i know one of my one of my clients in in slovenia for example they started 4 years ago together with five ski resorts to bring schools to skiing where they offer i think uh, fourth graders 10 year old kids uh, a day on uh, the snow for for free, basically paid by the ski resorts and some sponsors where anybody that's never skied before, that's the requirement, can come one day and get instructions and uh, enjoy uh, a day, in this case, uh, in the mountains. Uh, it's done in close collaboration with the Department of Education, with the schools, and it's a great success because every year you bring 1,000, 1,500 new kids on the snow and then uh, you know their parents come maybe their parents uh, like it uh, you have to expose uh, the people to the sport athletics is doing under the leadership of the of the sebastian co was an olympic champion now during this covid pandemic p pandemic they came out with a whole bunch of new initiatives to simply encourage people to walk to run not necessarily running 100 meters throw a discus or do a pole vault but simply to people to to move and start uh, uh, getting the benefits of being active. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, and that's the other thing about skiing, right? Like, I'll tell you this story. Uh, we did some um, advertisement on social media um, about the ski school, right? Because uh, water skiing, obviously, outdoor, individual sport, easy to keep distance. So this was one of the first sports that the Italian government allowed uh, to be resumed as we were phasing out of lockdown here in Italy. And so we said, you know, there's a lot of people that do sports that in Italy that can do their own sport right now, maybe even just like CrossFit or going to the gym. And so we said, you know, why don't we advertise a little bit, you know, and see, see if we can get people to try skiing. And, and so we targeted the advertisement to say cro exactly those two sports, CrossFit and snow skiing, right? So we thought it was a good a good target and a lot of the people would send message or, or, or put mess uh, post on facebook by saying oh uh it's cheating like you're not doing any physical effort you're getting like you know towed around by a boat there's no movement and i don't know that they could be any further away from the truth you know I definitely <laughs> can say it's far away from the truth. It's very physical. Uh, you use all the muscles in your body. I think it's a very balanced uh, uh, sport in a way that uh, you use your whole uh, body. You know, your legs have to be strong. Your core has to be strong. Arms, shoulders. Uh, it's like uh, going on a vibration plate in the weight room for 15 minutes. You know, and <laughs> it, I think it's it's very effective to to stay in shape and uh, you know. Again, I think uh, maybe some education needs to be done, and uh, you know, during these days of uh, you know of green uh, 
deals and environment and all these things. Of course, uh, having a boat that burns uh, gasoline uh, is for many people uh, a hurdle that they don't want to jump over. But uh, you know, I'm I'm sure the the, the positives uh, outweigh the negatives in this sense. And uh, I think a lot of people, if they try it, would uh, would like it. But you have to find a way to to get them excited and uh, get them into it. Yeah. Well, that's a. Uh that's what I'm trying to do with my podcast, you know, growing the sport and, and, and giving it exposure. Uh, as Key School here, we're trying to, as you got to see, like, you know, no matter if you've never tried water skiing or if you want to improve, like, that's what we try to do here. Um, Daniel, I don't know. Any, any final thoughts? Anything you want to say we didn't say? Look, again, thank you for, for having me on this podcast. I'm uh, very happy uh, I found this place. Uh, I came here. I got to, to meet you and uh, your staff and uh, I'm sure I will be back here frequently for many many years to come and uh, I'll try to do my part to uh, to spread the word and maybe get a few more people into this uh, water skiing uh, uh, as I did yeah well thanks a lot for doing this and thanks a lot for doing what you just said thank you boom all right what do you think great fun no fun too Thank you.